Next we need to look at storage areas and volumes. Now these are pretty important because they're fundamental to the operation of the system. This is where we store our data and our programs. How large each volume is is also related to how much space we need to allocate for what we believe to be the potential growth. So designing this particular part of the configuration is pretty much an important for, for future proofing your system and for ensuring that you get the best performance out of your, your NAS. First we need to understand what a storage pool is. A storage pool is an area of the, the RAID disk drive that's allocated for a particular purpose. Um, if you had a very large disk drive or a very large uh, uh, RAID pool of drives, you may, you could, there are reasons why you would have multiple storage pools. But in this particular case, we have four six terabyte drives, which does seem like a lot, but in the scheme of things, it probably isn't a particularly large um, a RAID pool, so we'll probably just create one storage pool. But a storage pool is a physical disk. It's created on a physical disk. Um, there are other sorts of physical disk or drives or storage areas that you have on a machine. You have an SSD cache and you have an SSD drive. Now in this case, this machine doesn't have either of those. It's just got the physical disks, so we'll be restricting our conversation to that. Now, volumes are created within a storage area. With, sorry, with a st within a storage pool. These storage pools from this previous slide. The SSD cache isn't really used for storage. It's used by the system to accelerate uh, IO ops to and from the disk drive. So it's kind of like a store and forward for information going to and from the disk drive. The SSC drive is also used for caching, but in a different way. So neither of these two are installed in this device, so we'll uh, just leave that out of the conversation for a while. Uh, USB, external USB drives, um, this machine will have the capacity to have a USB drive plugged into it, but it's not going to be part of the central storage. J, uh, virtual JBOM is an interesting mechanism with the QNAP devices. It is where your you basically make use of store, spare storage on another NAS on your network. Now, in this particular case, the customer hasn't got any extra, on, on each of the local networks, it won't have another NAS, so it can't make use of that either. But just for your interest to know what it is, uh, a virtual JBOB is, is where you can say, all right, I've got this second NAS in the same office, and it's underutilized, it, the storage, the spare storage on it. What you can do is, for it permanently or for a while, you can allocate that spare storage to one of the other NASs in the network, and it will, for all intents and purposes, appear to the users of that NAS as, a, as though it was local hard disk drives. So disk volumes is where we need to spend our attention now. In the, in the setting up of the system, here we go, we're going to go through a series of examples to explain how we might divvy up the drive to and create volumes for the different purposes. Uh, we might create, for example, volume one, and inside that there's a number of folders. There's a backup folder, download, multimedia, public, and web. Now there'll be other folders in there, but these are the, the ones that will cre create the, the majority of usage. Now there's a backup folder in your search setting of why would I have a backup folder inside a, a disk drive? And there are many good reasons. A few examples of that might be uh, inside the system when it's backing up, when it's creating backups during the course of uh, a day or a week, it may want to transfer those ba the backed up files into an area and then later on at night when the internet connection is not being heavily used, it could take copies of those backups and put it into an external storage like Google, uh, like Amazon Glacier, uh, Google Drive, uh, Amazon S2, um, Microsoft Azure and, and any of the other cloud-based backup services. So it then allows those files that have been created in that backup area to be shifted off-site to the external backup and then that area in the backup folder cleared and made available for the next backup. So it's like a, 
a, a, forward, a freight forwarding area to create uh, a channel, a pathway, if you like, through which backups are deposited and then moved on to something else. Uh, another one is um, snapshots. Uh, the system has this capacity, which I won't go into a great deal of depth just yet, but snapshots are a really useful tool to create and uh, to overcome problems such as, uh, let's say, for example, you have a, a number of really big files on your network and that uh, you, various workers maintain during the course of the business day. And for whatever reason, um, one of the files is corrupted when uh, the, the particular person who last opened it saved it. And you don't know about that because your backup is Kate making copies of that corrupted file and overwriting the other backups of that with a backup containing the corruption. So you've basically over a, after a month your only copy of that the last remaining good copy of that file is overwritten by the bad one because nobody has opened it for a month. And nobody knows that the the file that was corrupted. So a snapshot technology is another way in which the system can keep a longer trail of backups because it's only keeping what has been changed, and then it can go back to a uh, and it can reinstate a file at a particular point in time. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, idea and it's a great technology, but it needs a longer explanation than we have time for here. So uh, inside the backup paths, we have another downloads folder. A downloads folder is might be used because the NAS has its own download capability. So you can set the NAS to do a download on behalf of a PC, for example, so that the PC can then be shut off and people can go home and the download can continue. And when it's finished, the files are just sitting in that directory in the download folder ready to be picked up and used. Multimedia is another folder. now. Many of the streaming software and multimedia servers on the NAS will, by default, create their file structures underneath that multimedia folder. So um, it's I mentioned here for that purpose. There's a public folder which is used for a number of, for many many purposes. It's a public directory where uh, people have generic and transit files uh, stored uh, that might be then moved off to somewhere else when they've been worked on copied in or whatever and then a web folder which is underneath that web folder uh, the, the QNAP uh, NASs will install most of the web based applications and their data uh, so that's a pretty important file so this volume this first volume will we'll be creating in a minute and it'll put a lot of systems on there meaning it'll put a lot of the applications that are used by the system to run the that run the NAS so it's a, a it's a volume you can't really change once you've created it and we need to size it correctly for what it has within it. Uh, the second volume we might create, a second area of the disk drive we might create, is a, an area for what we call virtualization and containers. Now, virtualization is creating a virtual machine, which I mentioned earlier, which they're intending to use in this case to create a, a Windows 2000R2 server, or actually two, and a couple of um, Windows, uh, Windows 7 and a Windows 10 PCs. I, I'll start off with that. I imagine I'll probably have a lot more after a, after a while. So these uh, virtual machines, are, they don't have a keyboard, they don't have a monitor, they don't have a mouse. They're running inside the memory of the NAS. And anybody on any PC with, any, with their own PC can connect to that NAS and run it as if they were running it on their local de desktop. So it's a way in which a machine, any PC, can access another virtual machine that can be shared amongst the multiple users or in the case of the Windows Server people can log into that Windows Server and operate it just like a multi-user machine. A really good facility. The other virtualization concept that the NAS supports is containers. These are Docker containers. Docker is a mechanism by which the it can run a micro a server which is a fully functioned server but it's dedicated to us. It would normally be set up and dedicated to one purpose. And there's a um, there's a lot of great um, free downloaded downloadable servers that produce uh, that can be used for a number of uh, software applications, which again is probably beyond the scope of this video. Um, but uh, the le 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 just leaving it uh, this issue by saying that. Um, Docker is really important for Internet of Things. Many of the new innovations 
uh, in the area of the Internet of Things, that's home automation, process automation, manufacturing, uh, freight. Uh, there's there's tons of uh, new new innovations coming out, which will be delivered as Docker containers, uh, and so Docker's gaining a lot of interest, gaining a lot of support, and more and more companies are bringing out their applications as Docker containers, self-contained containers that can be downloaded and plugged into anybody's machine. Container station within the NAS is a mechanism by which you can use those containers right now. You can hook up to the to the Docker uh, marketplace and, and download those applications right now with this uh, container station capability. So we are creating an area of the um, a volume to store these uh, these containers as well as the virtualization uh, instances. Another one is production. We are allocating an area of the drive for production. And the production doesn't need to be very large, but it might well be something. If, for example, if a company is a manufacturer and they have files that need to be stored for their numeric controllers or their manufacturing controller machines, updates, utilities, drivers, uh, and data, uh, this, this volume would then be created to be used only by those people and then and restricted access only to those people. Uh, it's important to create a separate volume for that because its backup and its synchronization regime would be different to anything else stored on the NAS. Another uh, one is the local network. Everybody understands that, uh, uh, an area of the network where we store our web processing documents, Excel documents and, and the like. Uh, it might be Drive E, it might be Drive N, it doesn't matter what it is to you. Uh, it's, uh, it's an area that's shared with various permissions on the folder structures so that different people may or may not have access to certain files and folders. Um, and then finally, another volume, if you are using surveillance, well, at least allocate a volume for surveillance, you can always increase the size of it, where you'll be keeping the recording so that if somebody comes into the office in the middle of the night and the cameras kick off and take footage of that person and then synchronize it to the other offices so that uh, uh, that uh, event is recorded in more than one location. So you get the idea. The volumes are used to partition the information. And more importantly, on the right-hand side, we've, I have not mentioned it to this point, there's a user role. So as you're setting up the system, you would also not only be considering how, uh, how you might, where you might be storing things and what its potential size is, this estimated size column, but also the type of user that would may or may not have access to it. Now, in this particular case, we have four six terabyte drives, so we need to um, decide how much space for each of those volumes we need. So here are some examples. We took some sizes from uh, uh, example customer. And we're going to use that by comparison for comparison. But at the moment, using um, by by looking at the the example customers system, they have six terabytes allocated to the systems, six terabytes to the virtualization, three for production, five for PC LAN, and one for surveillance. Now, this machine has uh, four uh, six terabyte drives. So by the time you if you if you set it up, set them up as RAID 10, and then subtract some area for uh, snapshotting, you're going to end up with around about 10 terabytes. So obviously, uh, 6, 12, 15, 18, 19 terabytes. We don't have 19 terabytes to use, so we need to cut down some of that and think through whether or not it needs to be as large as it is. We also will need to make decisions on how frequently it's backed up and how frequently it's synchronized. These are two different things and two different options that the your organization has for protecting its data. So our selected sizes might well in this case be three terabytes for the systems because there's a lot of things in there, two terabytes for the Docker and the virtualization, one terabyte for production, it could probably even be less. The PC LAN network, three terabytes because in this case, this particular customer is already using a, uh, a little bit less than three terabytes. Now, what I allocate here during the setup of this machine can be changed. It's not hard and fast. It's important to understand that it's okay to allocate it just about what you need because we're going to use a mechanism in the drive which will allow us to expand 
those volumes, expand the size of the volumes. We can expand them, but we can't reduce them. So let's be realistic about what we think we need, allocate that. It's okay even if we had available space of 10 terabytes and we only allocated six or eight of that 10, we've got a two there in, uh, in reserve should we need it. The other interesting thing about the way we're going to do it and why we're going to allocate the space is that even if we allocated more than was available, the system would would just continue to use space until such time as you needed to add an additional uh, extension unit and it would inform you nicely and you could once you've added the extension unit would then continue to allocate and grow so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that as we're adding volumes anyway we create our volumes using storage manager so we'll just go into storage manager quickly The very thing, first thing we need to do is create a storage pool. New storage pool. Now, the first question we're asked is whether or not we want to enable Qtier. Qtier, as the as the text here explains, is a mechanism by which the system can create a number of different storage pools, each with different um, speed and resource capacity. RAID groups can be set up with as ultra high speed or high speed and, and high capacity. However, if we want to use that, we it's as it says here, it won't allow us to continue because we don't have an SSD drive installed. Remember, we 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 talked about that earlier in an earlier video. We don't haven't installed the SSD, although. The, um, the SSD drives could be installed at a later date. We can't use that facility now, so we'll check it off and press next. The next thing we're going to do is select all these four disk drives and nominate them to be RAID 10. Now, RAID, RAID 5 would give me 16 terabytes of space. However, there are, there are issues in a business, for a business system, RAID 5 is probably not the best choice. Uh, there are scenarios that there's plenty of information online if you want to check it out, but the short story is um, the, the potential for the probability of failure happening at, at a time when the drives are at the end of their life because a drive doesn't last forever. Just drives are moving parts. They're spinning at 50, to 5600 or 7200 or RPM, they're they're going to fail at some stage. They're never they're, there's no guarantees. They're not a backup tool. They are uh, a resource to allow you to manage the information, but you still need backup even with RAID. Uh, the RAID devices will help you and protect you against the failure of one drive. And if you use RAID 10, two drives, but it will not. <coughs> It will not allow you to. It, it's not a. It's not a substitute for backup because, you know, you can drop a brick on an, on a piece of equipment. You can lose it. There's floods. There's all sorts of other catastrophes that could happen. And if you haven't got a backup uh, plan in place that's active and working well, and something happens to the one location where your own, all your data is stored, uh, you, you're stuffed. So. Um, it's common sense, obviously, to have backup in place. Now, RAID 10 is different to RAID 5. Uh, if you will excuse my crude explanation here, I'll just try attempt to give you a, a quick layman's explanation of the difference. RAID 5 is a mechanism that's based on a minimum of three drives, so A, B, and C. You could re really run RAID 5 with three drives. And what it does is it basically copy makes a copy of each of the drives on it, it replicates itself across three or four drives so if you lose one drive you just say for example you lose drive C you can just take it out put in another a new drive C and A B and D will rebuild it because A B and D have everything that C has stored somewhere on them Whilst it's rebuilding C, um, if 
heaven forbid, one of the other drives failed, you're stuffed. This whole system is lost. And that's why RAID 5 is not recommended for business. And here is the catch the catchphrase. The reason why is that when you buy a NAS, you inevitably get all your drives at once. They come from the same, their serial numbers are often one or two apart. They come from the same batch, they have the same disk layers, they have the same engines produced by the same manufacturers at the same time, in the same environmental conditions, at the same temperature, same humidity, same, same, same. Everything's the same. The experience has shown us that there is a high probability that if one drive fails, another one will fail. The second thing, oh, the, the, the second factor here with RAID 5 that you have to consider is this. When um, RAID 5 works, it uses caching. It uses caching in the, in the machine, memory in the machine, to handle the writing. So that if I make a change and it stores it on drive A, it copies it to B and C in the background. Great facility. It speeds up the operation immensely. However, when, it's re when you lose that drive C, cache is immediately turned off. It has to. It has to do that. It has to turn the cache off so the machine's ultra slow by comparison to what it normally is. And when you plug that new C drive in, a, poor, poor old A, B, and D, they're working their butt off rebuilding C. They're working twice as hard as they've ever had to work. Now, um, um, uh, uh, these drives are very, they're very reliable, they're very good. The, 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 the engineering precision is, is incredible these days. They're, they're, they're fantastic units, but they are moving parts and they, they can fail. Now, if you've got, uh, if C fails and A, B and D were bought at the same time and the same serial number and the same everything else, they're probably close to their use by date as well. So suddenly, C files, you put a new C in, and these A, B, and D have to work harder than they've had to work for the last three years. They're tired, they're, they're at their end of life, and they've been made to work uh, two, uh, three or probably more than like 10 times as hard as they normally would work rebuilding C. And we're not talking about an hour. We're to, sometimes the rebuild of C could take eight hours. So these drives are getting hot, and they're rebuilding C, so the problem we have found through experience, and not just we at Smickbox, but the IT industry in general has observed that uh, it's there's a high there's a higher rate of failure of the other drives in a RAID 5 configuration just after one of the drives has failed and they're trying to rebuild it than there is in any other point in their life. So RAID 5 is not a good idea for business. Let's talk about RAID 10. RAID 10, you lose some space, but RAID 10 basically has a mechanism where A and B, for example, are a pair, C and D are a pair. You can lose D and you can lose B at the same time and put new two, a new B and a D in and, and A and C will do the job of rebuilding them. When a, one of the drives fails under B10. It's not. It's not using the same type of caching, so you don't get this degradation in performance that you do with RAID 5. Secondly, uh, if um, if A and B fail with RAID 10, you've got a problem because A and B are a copy of each other. So there's no there's no turning back. So even RAID 10 is not foolproof. And if similarly, if C and D fail you're also in trouble. But if you do your maths and you sit down with a calculator and you work out the, the probability of that happening, um, certainly RAID 10 offers a great deal better uh, protection than RAID 5. And so it is, it's, only, it's only vulnerability, as I mentioned, is if A and B fail or C and D fail at the same time, which is still possible, and that's why you have backups. So back at the console, we're going to create RAID 10. Interesting, this particular, well, all Kinect units have an ability to have hot spare. Hot spare just sits there, it's not used, and it's, it's available and ready to be swapped into the configuration should one of the drives start to fail. Uh, again, you can read up on hot spares and see what you think. It's an option you can use. It's entirely up to you.
Uh, next, it's asking us about the amount of space to reserve for snatch hops. Now, we can change this allocation afterwards, so it's okay for us to take the recommended space. But bear in mind, it does drop us down by another 2.35 terabytes to 8.5 terabytes of available space in the storage pool or in the volumes. The, um, the, the snapshots, as I mentioned earlier, are used as is an, is a useful form of it's a useful option to your backup and um, risk mitigation strategy. It's, uh, it's, it's again beyond the scope of this video, so I'll come back to it in a later session. But I would be inclined just to accept the recommendation here and continue and create. This part does take a few minutes, so I'll just um, pause the video while it's underway. Uh, back again, the um, didn't take as long as I thought. It's, as we know, it's a fast machine with fast disk drives. So it's now prompting us to create new volumes. In our prior slide here, we had the uh, recommended sizes that we were going to use for these volumes. Um, 3 terabyte, 2 terabyte, 1 terabyte. Uh, if we use that, that will be more than 8.5 of terabyte, which is uh, available space after the snapshot space has been reserved. So we're going to have to trim that even further. Moving back now to the screen, we'll first create a new volume. I think it's important for us to start off with three terabytes for the systems area. We're going to be using thin multiple volume. Now let's just go through these options. Static volume is going to create a fixed area of the drive and you can't change it. Uh, that's not what we want because we need to have the flexibility. We don't really know, even though we're making assumptions on how big each of these volumes might be, until we start to use it in earnest, we don't really know because even though we're copying from the existing uh, infrastructure onto this new NAS, the, the thing is that with the new tools and facilities available, the customer is highly likely to use the NAS in a different way and in fact take advantage of some of the new features. So we really can't say for certain how they're going to be used. Thin, thick volume, thick multiple volumes, again, requires us to allocate specific areas to each of the volumes that we create. But uh, it does it in a way that gives us a much better performance and still some flexibility. In this particular case, multi thin multiple volumes is the choice we're going to be used because uh, it's a fast enough machine and we're not as concerned about performance, but thin volumes allows us to create an area of, uh, to allocate an area. If we don't use all of it, some of the other volumes can basically use the available space. So even, for example, with thin volumes, you might have, let's say for argument, you had eight terabytes of space. You could allocate thin volumes with 20 terabytes in total of usage of space. Now, that doesn't mean you can use 20 terabytes because once you get to 8, it's all used. But the um, the top limit is a maximum. It's a ceiling of the, the, the maximum that the, that particular volume can grow to. And uh, in, in the same way, you can also uh, create thin volumes with roughly what you think they're going to use and then expand them. Uh, whereas with the other options, it's not as straightforward to expand. So we'll use thin volumes, thin multiple volume. Our first one is our systems volume. We're going to call it volume one systems. If I forget to change the name, there's a way to come back and change it. It's an alias, a volume alias, and we're going to allocate three terabytes. That was our first volume size, if you remember from the PowerPoint. Next. Now the alert threshold is where it is obviously what, as, as the name suggests, if the, the usage of that volume gets to 80%, it will start to alert the administrator that the space is filling up, giving you the opportunity to extend the size of the volume before you reach the ceiling and things stop working. So we have three terabytes, 80%. Let's press the accept and that will then start to create a 
the volume. Now you can see it's doing this formatting. It should take a little while, and I'll pause the video while it's running. I'll just uh, make a comment while it's running. You'll notice that um, it's now changed to creating share folders. The thing about the first volume you allocate in the storage pool when you're setting up a NAS for the first time is that this storage pool will contain not only the things that we have decided to store in there as per our PowerPoint presentation, but also it creates, creates it uses this to store a number of the, of the folders used by the system itself to run itself. So it's creating shared folders, it's creating a number of devices through which it will manage other services that the NAS provides, as well as creating the storage area that we'll be using for the, uh, the folders that we've nominated. It went through and did this optimizing function and now it's ready. So we're, it's time now to create the second volume. We'll create it as a thin volume again. Looking at it, back at our slides, we want something about two terabytes for virtualization. Bearing in mind, we can increase this should if we want to. We'll go with two terabytes, and we'll call it uh, volume two uh, virtual uh, virtual machines. and let that run for a moment. I'll pause the video while it's running. That volume is finished. Our next one is production at one terabyte. We might get to make this half a terabyte. We don't quite need a full terabyte for this. Actually, 100 gigs would be enough. Just pause and allow that to finish. Now you'll notice that uh, in a lot of these cases, the capacity that it's allocated isn't exactly what I put in. I allocated three terabytes for this one, two for that, 100 gigs for that one. That's because it rounds it up or down to match the block size of the just this drive itself. So if it does that, that's perfectly normal. That's uh, it, you can proceed, allowing the system to allocate that. Sorry, to find you those uh, sizes to match its own infrastructure. Sorry, to match its own blocks. Now we need three terabytes for the local local area network. Thin again. Three. PC lands nearly finished. Just completing the last stage is, is doing its optimization. And now the final volume for surveillance. We said a, a, a terabyte, uh, perhaps even half a terabyte would be enough. Because ultimately we're going to be moving the surveillance uh, off the machines onto other storage medium, be it CD or cloud, external cloud storage. So perhaps it's not as essential, and bear in mind we can expand it if we want to, to have as much, that much space. Uh, it 
it only takes that many characters, so I can't get in the S. But that's all right. Now, if we've created these volumes and then realized that we wanted to change a name, for example, we wanted to change this last one, you can click on the volume, go to Manage, rename the volume alias, and we could, uh, for example, just call it uh, Volume 5, Surveil. Supply, close, and we have a new name. So, if you have, if you want to change these names afterwards to something which um, better matches what you're going to store in it, then by all means you can. So now we have volumes on the on the NAS. We actually have drives that, or, or area storage areas that we can see from other machines. So if we were to, for example, go into File Station, which is the NAS's equivalent of the Files Explorer, you can see these volumes now exist. You could create folders underneath them, store files in them, and I believe even from the local area network, if I was to look for the device, uh, let's see. It's, at the moment, it's got the default name, NASFA8, BD7. There it is. So that, that's the name uh, that it's allocated to itself during installation. But as you can see, there are, there are folders there, which I can't get into yet because I haven't created any users and permissions and access. But the basic infrastructure of the folder system of the NAS is available now. So in the next section, we're going to go through now adding applications and updating those applications to the latest level. And once we've done that, we can start to allocate users and uh, have access to the system as a NAS.